we've already looked at the forces that hold individual molecules together. We call these bonds. But when we're trying to understand the behavior of compounds, that's definitely not the end of the story. It's also important to examine the intermolecular forces, the forces that come into play between molecules, the forces that play an important role in phase changes, in the solubility of a solute in a solvent, and in many other important phenomena we observe in nature. Take, for example, this glass of ice water. First of all, the only reason water even exists as a liquid at room temperature is because of the forces of attraction that hold the water molecules together. And the only reason that ice floats, that is, the only reason it's less dense than liquid water, is because these forces hold the water molecules in a three-dimensional pattern that leaves big holes. And that's a good thing, because otherwise our lakes and oceans would have frozen solid from the bottom up long ago. So, let's take a look at these intermolecular forces. It turns out there are several different kinds of widely differing strengths. We'll start with one we call dipole-dipole interactions. You'll recall that covalent molecules can be classified as polar and nonpolar, and that really this is not a black and white situation, but instead there exists a whole range of polarities in between. HCl, for example, would be a highly polar species, while N2 is highly nonpolar. In between, we find molecules like NO, where atoms differ only slightly in electronegativity. Well, imagine what might happen if two HCl molecules approach one another. The positive end of one molecule would attract the negative end of its neighbor, right? We call that attraction a dipole-dipole interaction, for obvious reasons. Here are two more polar molecules, methanol and water. And I think you can readily see how dipole-dipole attractions come into play when methanol encounters water. The dipole-dipole attraction accounts in part for the affinity of water for methanol. So, methanol readily dissolves in water. And indeed, the polar solvent, water, readily dissolves most other polar species for this reason. So dipole-dipole interactions are among the strongest intermolecular forces. And since we've been speaking about water, I'd like to introduce a special kind of dipole-dipole interaction, which is especially strong. Let's line up a couple of water molecules like this. Notice that the dipole-dipole interaction encourages this orientation. But notice, too, that if we show the lone and bonding pairs on the molecules, an interesting thing happens. This hydrogen atom can get confused. From its point of view, it sees an electron pair on the oxygen atom to its right, but also an electron pair on the oxygen atom to its left. Which is the bonding pair? This confusion results in something akin to resonance. The hydrogen atom shares bonding to both oxygens rather than to just one. Thus, what started as a dipole-dipole interaction becomes an arrangement of partial covalent bonds. And this arrangement can extend among many water molecules, like this. We call these partial bonds hydrogen bonds. In the liquid, these hydrogen bonds are forming and breaking constantly. But as the temperature cools, the water molecules get frozen in place by these hydrogen bonds, leaving big gaps and causing the density of ice to be lower than that of the liquid. Hence, ice floats. Hydrogen bonds are the strongest intermolecular forces, at least among neutral molecules. Let's now look at the weakest. These weak forces are called by various names, London forces, dispersion forces, London dispersion forces, or induced dipole, induced dipole forces. Huh? Call them what you will, here's how they work. First, let's be clear that these weak forces apply to all molecules, polar or not. But they are so weak compared to other forces, they're only important among nonpolar species. Take the nitrogen molecule, for example. As you know, the electrons in a molecule aren't static, but constantly on the move. So it's conceivable that, for an instant, 
the electron cloud in this molecule might be denser on the left side than on the right. Then the next instant, the charge might shift. Now, if another nitrogen molecule comes alongside, the temporary dipole of the first molecule will induce a dipole in the second molecule. And this effect results in a temporary, albeit weak, attraction. These are the weak forces that cause nitrogen to condense to a liquid, but only at a very cold 77 Kelvin, or minus 196 degrees Celsius. Brrr. Naturally, the larger the nonpolar molecule and the more weakly held its electron cloud, the greater degree to which the electron cloud can shift. We say the molecule is more polarizable. So small molecules or atoms feel this effect much less than bigger ones. And for this reason, we see a regular increase in boiling points among the increasingly larger noble gas atoms as we proceed down the family. Now that you understand how a molecule can be polarizable, you're ready for the next intermolecular force, the dipole-induced dipole interaction. Let's imagine a nonpolar molecule like nitrogen here coming alongside a polar molecule like water. Clearly, the dipole of water can induce a dipole in the nitrogen molecule like this. And when it does, an attraction occurs, doesn't it? As you might imagine, this attraction is intermediate in strength between a dipole-dipole interaction and dispersion forces. It's responsible for the low level of solubility of nonpolar gases like nitrogen or oxygen in water, for example. And that accounts for much of the life we encounter in our oceans, lakes, and rivers.